Somebody asked me Friday if I was going to say anything about the Oklahoma-Nebraska game. <laughs> and, I mean, it just feels too fragile, you know? Like, as a good friend, you just know, like, when can we make that joke and when can we not? And now is the not moment. So, I'm just going to move on and talk about the sermon, okay? <laughs> Love you all. And uh, thanks for putting up with me. Um, My family moved from Southern California to Omaha in 1982 uh, when I was just a little kid. And at that time, after considering their options, my parents decided to build a new home on what was then the outskirts of Omaha, like the very edge of the city, 150th and Dodge. Um, I mean, I know for some of you that live here now, that's hard to imagine, but back then, 144th Street was like cornfields, right? It was, if you got to 144th, you were in farmland, and Elkhorn was a whole nother city. It wasn't just like West Omaha. It had like its own stuff. You like had to drive through farmland to get to Elkhorn. Uh, As a kid, I obviously didn't understand really the process of building a house. My parents said we're building a house, and I didn't really understand everything that that meant. I just knew it meant that we can't live in it now, but we will eventually. And so I would ask them, hey, can we go to see the new house? And so we drove to the neighborhood, and they're like, well, here it is. And it was like a hole in the ground and a big pile of dirt and some concrete in the hole. And they were, like, they were excited. They walked up and looked in like, hey, you know, it's like really, it's, they're making progress. And I just remember my little seven-year-old brain thinking, that does not look like a place I want to live. Like, this does not look good. This is not as cool as the house we just left in California. And uh, so to help me out, they took me around the corner and down the street to the model home for the subdivision that was being built. And it happened to be the exact same floor plan of the house that they were building. And you know how this works. Like the model home, if you're in a new neighborhood, is the home they build first and they deck it out and they do all the nice finishes so that they can walk you through it and be like, don't you want to live in a house just like this? Isn't this awesome? And so it has all the best furniture and it has all the best finishes and all of that stuff. And so I remember them walking me in there and be like, all right, so it's kind of going to be like this. You know, here's where the kitchen will be and here's where the living room is. And You feel free to go upstairs and see kind of what your room is going to look like. And the idea is that that when you have a model home, it helps you imagine what the neighborhood is eventually going to look like, even though right now it's just a bunch of dirt and streets and, you know, maybe electrical wires stick up out of the ground. Eventually, this neighborhood is going to look like this. Well, with that in mind, I want you to listen to this quote from uh, the former Westminster Seminary professor, Dr. Harvey Kahn. He writes, on a tract of earth's land, purchased with the blood of Christ, Jesus, the kingdom developer, has begun building new housing. As a sample of what will be, he has erected a model home called the church. In this model home, we live out our new lifestyle as citizens of the heavenly city that one day will come. I love that image because it's a great way of understanding what the church is is according to God. It's the church is intended to be the model home for the new heavens and the new earth. It's a community that anticipates one day what will be. I mean, imagine a human community where every person you meet was quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Like if that was just the norm, wouldn't you want to live in that neighborhood? That's what the new heavens and new earth is going to be like. That's where humanity is headed. And the church is supposed to be a little foretaste of that. And that, friends, is why God cares and why James cares and why you should care about the kind of person that you're becoming. Or as the Bible calls it, your sanctification. According to the Bible, every human being needs to be saved and sanctify. You need to, first of all, be saved from the guilt and shame and penalty and power of sin. Because according to the gospel, as we've already professed and sung so far this morning, according to the Bible, you are a sinner who has turned your back on God and tried to be your own God and rule the world in your own way. And you need to be saved or set free from the destructive power of sin. Sin is 
ruining you. It is making you less human. And unless you allow Jesus to deliver you and set you free from sin, your sin will eventually destroy you. So you need to be saved. And the good news of the gospel is that God saves sinners through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But not only do you need to be saved, you also need to be sanctified. Sanctification is the Bible's word, a biblical and theological word for the ongoing renovation of your character. Uh, You might also call it transformation or renewal. Sanctification is taking who you currently are and making you more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ so that you increasingly bear his image. That's what sanctification is, and that process of sanctification requires your active involvement. It's a work of grace, but it requires your active engagement and participation. The analogy that uh, John Ortberg has helpfully used is that sanctification is kind of like sailing, right? The power is the wind. If the wind is there, then you're good to go, but you've still got to hoist the sail. That's the effort that you have to put in. The power is in the wind, the grace of God, but there's work for you to do to get the sails up and catch that wind. And so the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 writes this, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Notice the combination of the grace of God and I worked hard, right? Grace and effort go together. And it's with that foundation that we come to our text in the book of James this morning. Quite simply, this text shows us what kind of people we ought to be and how we can become that kind of people. So let's look at it together. James chapter 1, if you're using a Bible underneath the seat, it's page 950 in that little Bible. James chapter 1 will be in verses 19 through 21, as you already heard read. The scripture tells us in verse 19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. How many of you are just killing it at this already? (laughs) Oh, you're not? Well, me neither. Um, Right? This is one of those passages that immediately when you hear it, you're like, well, I I probably have some work to do there. Um, Every week as I preach, I'm always trying to faithfully just ask the Spirit of God to work on me first and do the work in me that he needs to. But especially as I was pondering the text for this week and just realizing how slow I am to hear and how quick I am to speak and how quick I am to become angry, I need the wisdom and the grace of this text. And I imagine you can see a need for growth in yourself as well as we hear this. And notice the text says, let every person be. So just to be clear, this isn't only for some Enneagram types or some Myers-Briggs types. This isn't just like some of you guys need to do better here, right? This is a universal imperative. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And it's obvious why, isn't it? If we go back to our model home analogy, God's vision is that when people encounter Christians, they would encounter a kind of relational beauty and a kind of personal maturity that is compelling. That's why God cares that we become this kind of people. So let's slow down and consider each of these exhortations. Let every person be, first of all, quick to hear. One of the most profound ways we honor another human being is by listening to them. Isn't it true that the people in your life who are good listeners, you generally feel honored and valued by? 
And the people in your life that you feel like, they don't really have time to listen. You generally don't feel as honored by those people, right? It's just true that when people listen to us, when we feel like they really care what we're saying and what's going on and what we're processing and thinking about, when we feel like people really listen, we feel honored by them. And furthermore, Christianity at its heart is a listening faith. To become a Christian, you have to stop talking and start listening, right? God speaks and we listen as we attend to the scriptures, as we cultivate the habit of prayer, we become a listening kind of people. The more we mature in faith, the better listeners we become. About a decade ago, I went through some training to become certified as a church planting coach so that I could coach pastors and church planters, people like Femi who are trying to plant new churches. And uh, so I had to go through this training to be certified to do this. And like a lot of the training that you probably have as well in your vocation, it's a combination of some classroom learning, but then some supervised actual coaching, right? Where I'm coaching someone and there's a supervisor sitting there just observing the process and their job is to give feedback. And what was really profound, it taught me a lot, was that the the guy who taught this training uh, had one rule for everyone to become certified as a church planting coach and the rule was this, you can never speak a sentence that doesn't end with a question mark. If you want to be a good coach, All you're allowed to do is ask questions. You may not issue proclamations. You may not give declarations. You may not say, here's what I think you should do. All you get to do is ask questions. And so a lot of the training, the actual like role playing was just, can you ask enough questions to help this other human being sitting across from you come to their own conclusions and begin to discover what the right steps are in their context for the problems they're trying to solve? And so I remember in some of the supervised things where I would like forget the rule and say, well, I think you should do this. And the supervisor would go, hang on, Um, Bob, could you rephrase that in the form of a question? And so, you know, occasionally I would just go like prosecuting attorney and rephrase it like, don't you think you should do what I just said? (laughs) And then the supervisor would be like, no, 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 yeah, you don't get to, that doesn't count, right? But the whole point of that training was that the more you are an active listener and ask good questions, actually the more helpful you are to other people anyway, right? It was training those of us who were leaders and tend to be maybe a little bit headstrong and a little bit directive. It was training us to learn how to be quick to hear, to pay more attention, to listen better. Let every person be quick to hear. Second, slow to speak. This is classic biblical wisdom. Proverbs 10, 19 says this, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. I mean, what's interesting is where else but the Bible will you hear this right now? Think about the world of social media that we live in and think about the prophet and incentive structure that drives all of those businesses. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, insert whatever app here. These companies all make money by enticing you to be quick to speak, don't they? You need to post about that. You know what you should do? You should post about that because the world needs to know what you have to say about that, whatever that is. So we live in a society that's telling you, be quicker to speak, say more and say it faster. In fact, if you don't speak, it must be because you condone whatever bad thing is going on. So how do we know that you're against that unless you post or tweet or say something about it? All the world we live in is be quicker to speak. But friends, I want you to hear the Bible telling you that being slow to speak is a virtue. You don't always have to have something to say. And in fact, 
even when you do have something to say, the world doesn't necessarily need to hear it. It's okay if you have something to say and you're the only one that knows that you have something to say about that. That's actually okay. Listen to Proverbs 17, verse 28. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. When Aaron Burr tells Hamilton, talk less, smile more, all he's doing is borrowing the wisdom of the Bible. One of the classic spiritual disciplines in Christian spirituality is the discipline of solitude and silence, where we get away and spend time alone in silence without communicating with other human beings and with the goal of simply communicating with God. And this discipline seems like it's practiced less and less in the world that we're in, but as people of faith heeding the wisdom of the book of James, it's probably a discipline we need to practice more and more. Um, by God's grace, someone introduced me to this discipline years ago, and so I've been trying for about 20 years to cultivate a, a habit about every three months of being away for a disciplined time of solitude and silence, 24 to 48 hours of just not talking. Um, it's amazing what that discipline begins to do for my clarity of thought, for the depth of my soul, for my experience of communion with God. It's a powerful and meaningful thing, and it has a profound impact on how I live in the world, especially because a lot of my role requires a lot of interaction and a lot of connectedness with people and a lot of engaging in the world. But I've learned that I need to practice solitude and silence because otherwise there's no way I can become slow to speak. Quick to hear, slow to speak, finally slow to anger. And again, James here is just riffing on Proverbs. Proverbs 14, 29 says, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding. In fact, God himself is slow to anger. There's this repeated description of God that we find throughout the Old Testament in places like Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And actually, understanding God's anger can really help us here in understanding what it means for us to be slow to anger. When we experience anger, we tend to experience it as an overpowering emotion, right? It comes on suddenly and it feels like you are suddenly just in the grip of anger. I mean, if you guys have seen the movie Inside Out, doesn't that do just a good job of sort of explaining what anger is like, right? It's that thing inside you that wants to just vent and come out. And all of our metaphors about anger are metaphors of being hot and boiling over because that's how we experience anger when we feel it. When the Bible, however, speaks of God's anger and God's wrath, it's not talking about an emotion. God does not get riled up. God does not fly off the handle. God does not get fed up. Rather, God's wrath is his settled opposition to evil and to injustice. God loves everything that is good, and God is opposed to everything that is evil. And James wants us to become more like God, to be less provoked by insults to our own glory, and to be more steadily concerned for his glory. We live in an outraged culture, don't we? Where the way to show that you actually care about something is to show how mad you are about it, right? But what if in a world full of outrage, God's people were just people of steady, wise, non-dramatic opposition to what is evil. Like, do you know you can oppose what is evil in a steady, gentle, wise way? God is like that. And James wants us 
to be like that. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Why? Verse 20, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So you can see here we have two ideas set in contrast. We have the anger of man and the righteousness of God. So let's consider, first of all, that second idea, the righteousness of God, because this is a key theme in Scripture. And when the Bible talks about the righteousness of God, it has at least four aspects to it. First of all, righteousness is an attribute of God. So sometimes when the Bible speaks of the righteousness of God, it's talking about a characteristic, an attribute that God has in himself. God is righteous. But second, sometimes when the Bible speaks of the righteousness of God, it's talking about an action of God. That is that God acts righteously in the world. God does what is right and just and good. There's a third way that the Bible speaks of the righteousness of God, and that is as a gift. For instance, in the book of Romans, we read of the righteousness that God gives, grants, gifts his people by faith. This is what sometimes is called passive righteousness because as opposed to being something that we accomplish, it's something we receive as a gift from God. Martin Luther called it the great exchange in places like 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 where the scriptures tell us, for our sake God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Luther said, hey, 2 Corinthians 5 and other verses in the Bible are talking about this great exchange where you are sinful, Jesus Christ is righteous, God takes your sin and counts it as though it belongs to Jesus, God takes Jesus' righteousness and counts it as though it belongs to you, by grace, as a gift, this righteousness that is not yours becomes yours. It's given to you by the grace of God. But fourth, sometimes when the Bible speaks of the righteousness of God, it's talking about a goal, something God intends in the world. God intends for his people to live righteously in the world and to pursue his righteousness in the world. When we pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, this is what we're praying for. We're praying, God, let your righteousness define how we live and how our world looks. This text in James has primarily that fourth meaning in view. When James says, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God, what he's saying is, your anger doesn't accomplish the results that God is after. You getting mad doesn't make God's kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, why should every person be quick to speak or quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry? Because your anger does not move forward God's purposes in the world. So one thing we need to learn how to do is to interrogate our anger. Uh, one thing that I've learned through some helpful mentors over the past few years is that that emotion of anger that flares up in me is a sign that something is valuable to me. Right? Something valuable has been crossed. Some, something I care about is threatened. And so when I feel anger, one of the things I want to ask is, what is it that's being threatened? What's under threat right now? And oftentimes the answer is, what's under threat is, the way I want things done, my preferences, my honor, my glory, somebody respecting me and doing what I want done in the world. And guess what? Those are all indicators that my anger is sinful and wrong. Right? So I need to interrogate the emotion of anger in order to become slow to anger, in order to develop the kind of long fuse and gracious disposition that allows me to have a, a rightly settled opposition toward things that are wrong in the world. So what kind of people ought we to be? Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. That's the simple vision James gives us of what the model home looks like, all right? You just walk through the model home in the new neighborhood, and that's sort of the simple description of what it looks like. Now, how can we become that kind of people? 
If that's what we're supposed to be like, how do we get that way? Well, look at verse 21. Therefore, in other words, because this is what God wants, because this is what every person ought to be like, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. One of the things I love about James is the starkness of his language. He is not afraid to say it like it is, and he is not into nuance. He just wants to grab your attention, right? I mean, we would not say, like if we were talking about our anger and our quickness to speak and all the things that that produces in our lives, if I was like, hey, you know what? Talk to me about like just where do you struggle to like speak in ways that honor human beings and that honor God? You know what you would say to me? You'd be like, well, you know what? I got some areas where I need to work. I got some things in my life that probably, you know, I'm, I'm not doing so great there. There's places that could, I could do better. You probably wouldn't say, I need to get rid of the filthiness and rampant wickedness that's in me. That's what James says. James is like, let's just call it what it is. Let's stop trying to be really nice with our language. What if we stopped making excuses for our anger and for all the sins we commit with our speech? Things like gossip and slander and vulgarity and coarseness and demeaning and degrading others and boasting about ourselves. What if we had the courage to call all that what it is? And just say, you know what? I got a lot of residual wickedness in my life that needs to be put away. That's how James wants you to think about this. And notice the two verbs, put away and receive. So there's something we're to put off and there's something we are to put on or take in. Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Or as some translations read, put away all that remains of wickedness. What this is getting at is it's acknowledging that we are not yet the people we need to be. Like the fact that you belong to Jesus Christ doesn't mean there's no remaining wickedness in your life that needs to be dealt with. There are residual habits and patterns of sin that need to be put to death. And James wants us to be clear-eyed about that. And the verb put off or put away here is a verb that's used throughout the Bible to describe like changing your clothes. I mean, think about like if you come in, think about the dirtiest your clothes have ever been, right? Were you like working on a car, working in the yard, helping somebody clean up a house that was a mess, right? Just think about like whenever you've come home and been like, man, I cannot get out of these clothes fast enough. Like I need these off. I need to take a shower. I need to put on some different clothes and I need these to either go in the laundry or maybe even in the trash because they are filthy, right? That's the kind of idea James has. He's like, hey, let's put that stuff off. Let's leave it behind. And then by contrast, put away filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. On top of our state capitol building in Lincoln, Nebraska, is a statue called the Sower. And you're probably familiar with it. It pays homage to the agricultural heritage of our state and of this part of the country. But it also is reminiscent of one of the most famous parables Jesus ever told, the parable of the sower. And Jesus used this analogy of a person sowing seed and said, let's, let's imagine a sower going out to sow and he's just scattering seed. And some of that seed falls on rocky soil and it just can't establish any roots and so it doesn't grow. And other seed falls among the thorns and the weeds and they grow up and they choke it out and it can't grow. But some of that seed finds good soil and it grows up and it produces a crop. Let him who has ears to hear, hear. And then Jesus goes on and does something else, right? And as is common in Jesus' parables, his disciples come to him later and they're like, hey, you know that parable you told about the sower? What was that about? What's the point you're making with that story? And Jesus said, the sower sows the word. So the seed in the parable, Jesus says, is the word of God. It's quite likely that James 
the brother of the Lord Jesus, was in the crowd when that parable was told. Now, he would have been in the crowd as one who did not yet believe in Jesus, as one who wasn't yet persuaded of the things Jesus was saying, but he would have heard that story and remembered that parable. And can you imagine, after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, when James, the brother of Jesus, realizes all that Jesus said is true, and when he receives the word of the gospel and is changed by it, Imagine now all of that crashing into this text and imagine or hear again the words receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. See, a seed has power in and of itself, right? All you have to do is plant that thing in the right soil and water it and what's going to happen? It's going to grow. This is just in the structure of reality. Seeds have within them inherent power to grow and become something. And likewise, Jesus taught, and James is teaching, God's word has inherent power. If we will just receive it, if we will just let it have its intended effect in our souls, we will be changed. It will produce fruit in our lives. When you habitually take in the Word of God, hearing it, reading it, learning it, you become quicker to hear. When you are captivated by God's words, you're less, you're less prone to be impressed with your words. So it will make you a person who's slower to speak. When the wisdom of the scriptures starts to shape the contours of your soul, you will find yourself becoming slower to anger. Our fathers and mothers in the faith understood the inherent power of the word of God. They understood that there's something in the word when it's preached, proclaimed, read, sung, taken into our lives and souls. There's something about it that does something. Listen to this famous prayer from the Book of Common Prayer from the Church of England. This is the prayer that the Church of England has prayed for about 400 years before the reading of Scripture. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy Scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. I love the language of hear, read, mark, Learn, inwardly digest. This is not a prayer for people who are flitting along the surface of the scriptures, just trying to get a bumper sticker wisdom to guide them through the day. This is a prayer of people who want the word to get in them and change them. This is the prayer of people who understand the power of the implanted word. But there's something even more powerful in this image James uses of the implanted word. So yes, he's probably thinking of the parable of the sower. Yes, he understands that the word of God, like a seed, has inherent power. And when it gets into us, it will change us. But also, James is reminding us of the greatest promise in all of Scripture, the promise of the new covenant. You see, at the end of the long saga of the Old Testament, after God's people had repeatedly failed to follow the blueprint and become the model home he intended, the prophet Ezekiel made this promise. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord your God, 
It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Likewise, the prophet Jeremiah, making a similar promise, says this, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It's as though God is saying, instead of just handing over the blueprints to a contractor, I'm going to come and build the house myself. See, in the Old Covenant, God had given his people the Ten Commandments. He had given them his law, which was a wonderful blueprint for human flourishing. A plan for the kind of people they ought to be and and what the new neighborhood should look like. I mean, to this day, the Ten Commandments are an amazing summary of just the basic human flourishing kind of society that we would all want to live in, where people don't steal and don't lie to each other and honor one another, and uh, right? There's just a baseline beauty to what God prescribes in the Ten Commandments. The problem was, is people couldn't follow the blueprint. It was like, It's like hiring the wrong contractor to build your house and they just keep messing everything up. And you're like, just follow the plan. So God declares that he's making a new promise. He's going to do something even better, not just a plan that shows the kind of people we ought to be. But he's going to give us his own presence. He's going to come and do the work himself. This new neighborhood, he's not just going to design it and hand over the plans and say, make it like this. He's going to come and personally build every house in the neighborhood. That's the promise of the new covenant, which God is fulfilling when he comes into the world in Jesus Christ. And after the resurrection of Christ, through the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is God doing in all of that? He's writing his word on our hearts. He's putting his spirit within us. He's changing our desires so that we want to obey him and walk in his ways. It's something better than a plan and a blueprint and a picture of what it should be like. It's God's own presence accomplishing that very plan. The 18th century hymn writer John Berridge wrote a little poem that captures in just four lines the difference between law and grace, between old covenant and new covenant. The poem goes like this. Run, John, and work, the law commands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. Far sweeter news the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings. When James says, receive with meekness the implanted word, what he's saying is receive the word of the gospel. Let this good news get into you and change you. Receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Receive the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Let God Remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I pray that you might respond to that gracious invitation this morning and let Christ build the house of your life. Let's pray together. Our Father, we ask you quite simply, would you 
Plant your word in our souls this morning. For those of us who need to receive the word, the message of the gospel, and allow you to remove our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Would you help us to receive that gift this morning? And Father, for those of us who need to hear your word with fresh ears and be renewed in our understanding of all that you have said, would you give us new hunger for your word, for your truth, and for it to get down in us and change us? Thank you that by your grace you take people who are slow to hear and quick to speak and quick to anger, and you forgive their sin, and you transform them and make them into people who are more and more quick to listen, more and more slow to speak, and slower to become angry. Do that work in us this morning for our good and for your glory. Amen.